That's good. That's good. I never cease to marvel at the grace of God. When He deals with His children, and He deals with you as with a son. And if He doesn't deal with you as a son, you're not a son. For every son the Lord receiveth, He chasteneth, He scourges. Turn to the book of uh, James chapter 1 with me, if you'd like to stand this morning as we open the book. James 1. I'm going to read three scriptures and then, then you can sit down. James 1 verse 21. And then 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 4. And then James 4 verse 8. James 1 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And then in, uh, you can just go on James 4 8 while you're in that book. James chapter number 4 and verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your heart, hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. In the same context, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. And then in the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 3 and verse number 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Now watch carefully. Which in the sight of God is of great price. Father, bless this book. In thy name I pray, Holy One, and amen. You can be seated. There's not a whole lot said anymore, really, about meekness and about humility or what it can gain or what it can do. But if it's wrought in the heart the way the scripture says that it should be, there is no limit to what it can do. For the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished everything he did on this earth in meekness and humility. The Bible said he was crucified in weakness. Therefore, he yielded himself. And when he did, it eventually led him to the cross. The condescension of the Lord Jesus Christ is incremental. In plainer words, there was far more to his condescension than simply coming down out of heaven, in which he certainly did. And I'm going to give you this morning some of the things that we know for certain, the steps that he took in his condescension. In the book of Philippians chapter number 2 and verses 6 and 7, it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. A huge step in humility and condescension was becoming a man. You say, well, now what difference does that make, preacher? He went back to heaven when God gave his son while he rose from the dead and he went back to glory. It made a big difference because he will never cease being a man. He became the God-man and that forever. That angel of the Lord, that second person of the Trinity, the one who spoke worlds into existence, now has nail prints in his hands and in his feet and the figure of that crown of thorns rammed down upon his head to forever bear witness to the condescension of the Lord Jesus Christ when he laid aside his heavenly glory and took upon himself the form of a servant, my friend, that was forever, that was eternal, that, was, that can never be changed. But my friend, that only led to the next step 
In the book of Luke chapter number 2 and verse 7, the Bible says she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. A manger is where you feed animals. He was born in a stable. He wasn't born in a king's palace, though he had ever right to be. He wasn't born in the affluent or the rich. No, sir, he was born with the poor. He made his, he made his, God made his birth with animals as they stood around the birth of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Remember this this morning. God doesn't see things the way we see them. He does not put value where we put value. The Bible just told you that a meek and quiet spirit is of great value in the sight of God. His condescension continues. In Luke chapter number 2 and verse 51, the Bible said he went with them. He went down with them. And he came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Here is the Lord God Almighty. Here is God manifest in the flesh, yielding himself to sinners, yielding himself to human beings, yielding himself and becoming, becoming submissive to them. That took something, my friend, don't you think? Because here were people of this earth and he was from above. Condescension leads to condescension. Humility builds upon humility. Faith begets faith. Spirit begets spirit. When God begins to move and move you where he wants you, he will take you incrementally. You will pass one st step on to another. You will pass one challenge to another. And God will prepare you for what he intends to do with you. He will never pick you up by your bootstraps and take you from a place where you are totally unprepared and put you into a ministry where you may be ministering to sick people or dying people or unsaved people and simply say, well, he's been given the gifts. He can do it. It doesn't work that way with the Lord. The Lord forms you. He fashions you. He's the potter and you're the clay. He puts his hand to the wheel and he spins you and he touches this part and he touches that part. He touches what he needs to touch. He knows exactly where your heart is right Right now and where it needs to be somebody needs to minister to you but is there anybody that can minister to you somebody needs to know understand and understand what's going on in your heart but is there anybody that can understand what's going on in your heart have you been through something and felt like people were doing their duty and trying to help you but they just really didn't understand what it took to reach down and pour in the oil and the wine have you ever been there where you're understanding what I'm saying to you this morning it's not an easy thing and it's certainly no cheap thing when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at Calvary that was the culmination of steps downward 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 in humiliation he said I am meek and lowly of heart and he indeed is still meek and lowly of heart for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble in the book of John chapter number 5 and verse 30 he said I can of mine own self do nothing he had yielded himself in complete obedience to the heavenly Father, the Lord God Almighty. In John 5, 19, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, The Son can do nothing of himself. This is complete dependence upon the Father. This is the one that gets most of us because of our pride and our arrogance and our accomplishments and our ability. He has to reduce us to a place to where we must depend upon Him. The Holy Ghost will not work through an arrogant and proud vessel. Make no mistake about it. He must prepare the vessel by the Spirit of the living God. And so the Lord Jesus Christ took another step downward in his humiliation. The Bible said in Mark chapter number 10 and verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to minister unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. No slave ever walked this earth that was more of a slave than the Lord Jesus Christ. He became a slave to mankind to minister to every need that you have. You have needs that you don't even know about. 
You have weaknesses that you've never been confronted with yet. There are doubts in your soul that are still hidden deep, deep, deep within you. It takes an experience in life to open up the inside of a man. And there's only one that can cause that to happen to you. And there's only one, my friend, that can read your title clear. You try to help yourself. You try to depend on, you try to say, you try to work out your problems. Say, well, I need this. I'm spiritually deficient in this. I need this. I need that. But the truth of the matter is, fall on your face before God. Yes. Bury your head in the carpet and say, Lord God Almighty, I don't have a clue what I need. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. And the condescension continues. In the book of Matthew, chapter number three, and verses 13 through 15, he submitted to battle. Baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. John the Baptist never baptized a righteous man. He didn't baptize a sinless man. He did not baptize anyone that was not deserving of baptism. He said to the Pharisees, he said, you generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? And yet the sinless, perfect, righteous Son of God walked down into the Jordan River and was taken beneath the water by John the Baptist. Why, preacher? Because he alone and he alone could do it, became the representative man of all men in absolute and complete obedience to God the Father by putting his mark on God's prophet John the Baptist. This was God's man, John the Baptist. And therefore he said, suffer it to be so to fulfill all righteousness. This is obedience on my part. If you preach something, I'm party to it. If you do something, I'm part of it. God does nothing outside of his son. Amen. Amen. In his, and his condescension continues in 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. God does things sometimes it takes us a while to get an understanding of what's going on. When he submitted himself unto the Father, he submitted every part of his being unto the Father. When the Lord Jesus Christ offered himself up on that cross, that was the culmination of a life of absolute obedience in giving everything he had to the Father. He held nothing back. It's hard for us to do that. We want to hold back. Believe me, when you're riled, you want to rile again. When somebody pulls your chain you want to pull theirs if somebody attacks you you want to attack them back but you see the servant that is in complete obedience unto the father that doesn't have a will of his own that doesn't even have his own identity his identity is going to be forged by the father he'll let the father tell him who he is he won't have to go around telling anybody who he is. It'll become a revelation from God Almighty. This world is starving to death. They're dying and they're going to hell. Not because they haven't heard preaching. They've heard it till it's coming out their ears. It's not because they haven't been to church. They've been in church houses until, they are, until they're just jaded with it. It's not because they haven't been exposed to religion. There's a church on every street corner. Why are they going to hell, preacher? I'm going to tell you why. Because because they don't see anything different. They don't see anything different in the people who darken the church door on Sunday and then go to work with them on Monday. They don't see the difference. They hear the words, but the words are vain and empty. They fall to the ground. What draws you to Christ? What leads you to the Son of God? What warms your heart about Him? Why do you love Him? What is it about Jesus that is so wonderful and great to you? Tell me about that this morning. What are we preaching Christ for? What why is he so great? Why is he so wonderful? I find no fault in him, Pontius Pilate said. And we who can convince me of sin, he said. When he went to that cross, he gave himself and loved you every way you could be loved. He loved you with a perfect, sinless love that reaches down into the depths of your sin to however degradated you are or depth you dip to the depths you fall or whatever you've done or whatever you are. He still
still loves you and you know it. Once you're ever introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ and who he truly is, you'll never get over it for the rest of your life because that's one that can talk to you. You believe in him because my friend, his faith is real. You trust him because you know he won't lie to you. He's a, he becomes your savior because you know what he did. He did it and he did it well and he did it right and it doesn't have to be done again. That's why you love him and that's what men and women need to see. They don't need to see Charles Lawson. I can't save you and you can't save anybody. And you can't even save yourself. But that doesn't just come. That has to be wrought in you. That's got to be burnt in you. That's got to be formed in you. That's got to be placed in you. It's got to be put there by the power of God. And you can't do it. But you can humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. You can fall down before him and say, Oh, oh Holy One. Oh, Lord God, I know, I know, I know who you are. And I know what I'm not. And I need thee how I need thee oh how we need him Jesus Christ in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse 8 the Bible said being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross I want you to look at Calvary and I want you to consider this that was the end of a life of absolute complete obedience unto the Father that's what it took him to. It took him to that tree. It took him to the curse. It took him to the place of death. It took him to the moment of separation. It couldn't get any darker than it got at Calvary. And nobody could give more than he gave at Calvary. It was there that his obedience took him. And he said, I love you, Father. I love you more than anything else. I'm going to be obedient and nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to die upon the tree. And that's exactly what what he did and he died for you and he died for me humility took him there in obedience to the father it took him there it took him to fall before God Almighty at Gethsemane and said Lord not my will but thine be done not mine but thine and the blood came forth from his face and I can't help but believe that Almighty God breathed in the sense of incense he breathed in that sacrifice of his son nothing more could be done now it was settled. He's going to the tree. He's going to die. And he loves me. And he loves them. I've gone as far as I can go. I have manifested my love in a way there's no more that can be done. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, God was in Christ reconciling the world into himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the ministry or the word of reconciliation. That's love, friend. He's telling you something today. You've been ditched. You've been shot. You've been stomped on. You've been turned on. You've had everything happen to you that a human being can do to somebody. But he loves you. 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 The condescension of the Lord Jesus Christ took him down as low as you could go. But the Bible said God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, oh yes, he rewards humility. He rewards humbleness. He rewards a broken and a contrite spirit. Listen to him as he thunders in Isaiah. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Have you got a broken heart? Have you got a broken life? Have you got a broken spirit? Do you have a broken broken attitude? Do you Are you broken? Well, then think of this. It is at that broken place that he revives. The spring of living water gushes up. The manna from heaven is fed to you. It is there you begin to receive from God. Your arrogance and your proud and your pride, your pride, proud look and all of that puts a barrier between you and the Lord. You may want help. You may mean that you want help. You may tell the Lord I need help. But as long as your pride remains, it's a wall of separation between you and God. The Holy Ghost is so sensitive. He can be grieved so easily. And that pride, that proud look grieves him. God help me, you may say, to come to brokenness. God help me for my heart to be broken. God help me to put down all these walls of protection I've got built around me. I've been hurt before, preacher. I don't want to be hurt again. Yeah, but you can't get close to God with these walls built up around you. 
They've got to come down. You've got to come and trust Him. You've got to cast yourself before Him. You've got to fall at His feet. You've got to say, Lord God, I've been hurt, but Lord God, I'm going to trust You again. Help me. Pull me up out of this. Give me help, Lord. The Bible said He resisteth the proud, but He does what to the humble? You see, grace is the avenue that it comes by. A broken and contrite spirit opens the door, but he ministers it through grace. You can't earn it. You can't earn it. But grace feeds you. Grace forgives you. Grace restores you. Grace heals you. And through that avenue of grace. Well, how does that work, preacher? It's by knowing that I don't deserve it. But I know I can receive from him. Because he breaks you. And he breaks you down to where you can receive. Let's go on. Presumption. Self-reliance. Rebellion. A hard heart. Strife. Faithlessness. Self-will. All lead to damnation. You see, pride is the opposite of humility. The opposite of presumption is confidence. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I know thou hearest me always. Where did he say that? You ought to know. Where did he say that I know thou hearest me always, but for these that stand by, for those standing here, outside where? A tomb. Lazarus. That's right. He said, I know. What is that? That's confidence. Hebrews talks about confidence, that we can come boldly with confidence to the throne of grace. Have you been there? No, no, no. Most people don't go. Most people pray only when they sense a need. When they feel a need. And your greatest need to pray is when you don't feel a need. That's when you need to pray more than any other time. Get back in your closet and start talking to Him. Listen, a life that is lived with an intellectual faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, coming from your head and not your heart, is practical atheism. You're essentially no different from any man out here in this world Oh, I believe in the man upstairs or a supreme being or, oh, Jesus is the Son of God and the Bible's the Word of God. But it doesn't affect your life. It doesn't change anything about the way you live. You still live just like the world does. You feed your flesh, fornicate, drink, get into your dope, blaspheme. Your life hasn't changed. You say, well, I may be a little backslidden, a little backslidden. What are you talking about? There is no place for backsliding for the Christian. You're either walking in the Spirit, Romans chapter number 8, or you're going to be under the chastening hand of God. One or the other. There's no medium ground there. What's this talk about I'm backswell, I've been a little cold on the Lord for five or ten years. Been, what are you talking about? You either live and walk in the Spirit, Romans chapter number 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. There's power in the Spirit. There's joy in the Spirit. There's love in the Spirit. There's peace in the Spirit. The strife is gone. There's glory in your soul. You can walk with Him. You can talk with Him. You can feast with Him. You can sit at His table, and He'll sit down with you. All that can be done in the Spirit, but you can't do it in the flesh. But He said, if you don't do that, if you live after the flesh, you'll what? Die. So how, and how do I do this, preacher? Yield to him. His hand's on you right now. He'll put his big, wonderful hand upon your soul and say, I love you, son, or I love you, daughter, and I want to deal with you as a father deals with his child. That's what he wants. And if you'll do that, then he'll deal with, with you as with a son and purge this garbage from your life. You can't do it. You can no more do that than you can save yourself. But you can yield, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, the Bible says. Yield to Him. Now listen carefully. There is seen at the right hand of the Father at this moment a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek, right? Yes, thank you, Jesus. The Bible said He offered one sacrifice for sins forever and sat down at the right hand of God. One time, one sacrifice for sin forever. Do you realize that during His earthly life, he worked out and paid for and accomplished and produced a holiness and righteousness that did not exist until he did it. And everything he did now 
can be applied to you for your benefit if you'll simply humble yourself before his hand. There's not a one of us in this house that doesn't need to get closer to God. Not a one of us. There's not a one of us in this house that, doesn't des that, that shouldn't desire to have more and more and more of him and less and less of us. Right? Why won't you do it? Why don't you get up and come down here this morning and say, Oh God, I'm hungry, Lord. I don't want any more of me. I want more of you. It's not about me. It's about you. In the name of Jesus. Bless his name. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior. This service is in your hands now, Lord. Anything that's done is your Lord. It's your work. It's yours. Thank you for the opportunity to stand. Thank you, Lord. You raise me up, Lord. You raise me up. I give you my life again this morning. It's in thy hands. Blessed Jesus. Blessed, 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 blessed Jesus. Blessed Jesus. Blessed Savior. In thy holy name now, Lord. In thy holy name. Savior. Bless you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet it is. Blessed, blessed Jesus. And realize, God, who we are, how good we are to you. We need you, Lord. Blessed, blessed Jesus. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. God, yes, God, amen. God, his faith to come. Lord, is coming forth and realizing. Well, preacher, God, I, don't know, I don't know if God cares anything. Listen. The Bible said, by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. That's what it says in Hebrews. That's me. That's you. Everybody. Red man, yellow man, black man, white man, rich man, poor man, bond man, free man. Make a difference to the Lord. Christ's blood covers the sin. John the Baptist said, take away the sin of the world. Amen. Everybody. Everybody. I want no part of any idea where God excludes certain people and only saves and redeems a few. Not so. The Bible said he was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Even to those who crucified him, the Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a thing. Isn't that something? To the very ones who nailed him to the tree, he said, Father, forgive them. Hallelujah. So what's all that for? It's for a guarantee that if you come unto him, he won't turn you away. That's what it's for. It has power in it, Lord, to save with the same blood. God, that cleanses and strengthens, we'll love you for it. We'll praise your sweet name for it. Do you realize that every sin that a human being can commit, every sin, is connected to the same root cause? You understand that? It's born in the same place. It doesn't make a difference if it's murder, if it's theft, if it's a liar, if it's a profligate. They, it all comes from the same place. What is that? It comes from Adam's original sin. And the only thing that can do anything about Adam's original sin is belief in Christ. You inherited an awful lot of stuff when you were born. The Bible said in Revelation chapter number one, who hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. Bless your holy Amen. name. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God save anybody in here this morning? He may save you later. We've had a request to have a
altar prayer this morning. And uh, for uh, Sheila, we want to pray for her. If you'd like to come down here and meet with us now. Good time to have an altar prayer is after we've had an altar call. Amen. <laughs> 